This podcast accompanies the acclaimed new docu-series In the Eye of the Storm, which follows the remarkable journey of maverick economist, politician and whistleblower Yanis Varoufakis. Both the series and podcast explore the connections between power, democracy, capitalism and the deepening crises of civilization. The series is available to watch now. Details in the description. Enjoy the conversation. What I thought we could do with the time that we have today is dive deep into this relationship between the ecological crisis and our economic model. I'd like to add a caveat, which is critiquing our dominant model doesn't necessarily mean we are endorsing failed systems with authoritarian tendencies, which in our current climate is often what people assume as if there are only two possible options for humanity, both dismal. Um, so I think we're more optimistic than that. Jason, how would you present the relationship between capitalism and the ecological crisis? Okay, yeah, well, I mean, <laughs> there's quite a lot to talk about here. I know that Janos will also have some contributions, but um, I want to start with, with, uh, with the point you just made, actually, about this fear that people have, that once we start talking about a post-capitalist society or economy, uh, are we talking about something totalitarian? Now, uh, th this is strange to me, because I believe that our existing system is totalitarian. Uh, in, in, in several crucial respects, right? I mean, it's like the fundamental principle of capitalism is that it is, uh, is uh, anti-democratic. Uh, now, of course, we live in, in political systems, like at least some of us, many of us live in political systems where we uh, get to elect our political leaders from time to time, as corrupt and imperfect as that process is. But when it comes to the question of the economy, uh, uh, not even the shallowest illusion of democracy is allowed to enter, right? Um, I mean... Uh, our, our, our collective productive capacities, right? Our, our collective labor, uh, our planet's resources, our considerable endowments of energy and, uh, and human creativity, et cetera, are, um, are commanded by, by finance, by capital. Um, and by this, we mean like the 1% of people who, have the major who, who command the majority of investable assets, the large financial firms, BlackRock, Vanguard, et cetera, et cetera, um, the, large, the large corporations. They effectively determine uh, what we should be producing and for what, for what purpose and for whose benefit. Uh, and, uh, and for them, for capital, the, uh, the, overwhelming, the overriding objective of all production is to maximize and accumulate profit, right? Um, it's, I mean, the purpose of increasing production of any kind of production is not to meet human needs or to achieve ecological goals or to advance social progress. It is to maximize uh, profit. And so the result is that we, we're, we're basically hostage to this insane logic, right, um, which engages in, in really perverse forms of production. So we're in the middle of, a, of, a, of an ecological crisis um, where we actually have the technology to solve it. Uh, 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 I mean, there have been incredible advancement, advancements in re renewable energy capacity, um, but capital chooses actually to invest in fossil fuels and uh, in highly emitting activities, you know, SUV production, cruise ship production, private jet production, et cetera, et cetera, because these are highly profitable and more profitable than, uh, than doing the kind of ecologically necessary forms of production that we actually need. Uh, and, and so even though we can fix our ecological problems very easily, actually, um, and make uh, very serious progress on this quite quickly, we're effectively prevented from doing so uh, because we're hostage to, to, to capitalist control over our productive capacities. And I will say here that the same is true for our formidable social crises, right? Um, when we talk about uh, ecological crises, I mean, for a lot of people, they have difficulty resonating with this because social crises are actually more prominent for them. Uh, I mean, this is obvious in the periphery of the world economy, which uh, uh, is characterized by extraordinary, needless deprivation, um, but is clear also in the core where, um, you know, uh, uh, half of the U.S. population can't access decent health care, right? 25% uh, of U.S. Americans live in substandard housing. Across Europe, uh, uh, close to 100 million people uh, live in extraordinary economic insecurity. Uh, this, is, um, this is completely needless and is a consequence of the fact, again, that uh, capital mobilizes our productive capacities for, for other things, irrespective of human need. Uh, whereas we could be investing production in, in easily solving these problems, right? Universal healthcare and affordable housing and, uh, and renewable energy for all is, is an achievable dream. 
uh, we live in, uh, in a shadow of the society that we could achieve if we had proper democratic control over the productive forces. And I think that is, uh, that's the horizon, right? Uh, the, 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 the opposite of capitalism, the antithesis of capitalism is democracy. It is simply extending the principle of democracy into the economic realm where um, until now it has been prohibited. Uh, so when we think about a post-capitalist economy that can resolve our incredible social and ecological contradictions, I think that the, the principle of democracy uh, is absolutely central. It reminds me of that incredible stat about the level of investment into fossil fuels since the Paris Climate Accords, which I think is around four trillion, which just shows you the priorities of capitalism. It's not that we don't know where we need to put the money, but it, it doesn't matter. The logic of capitalism is so powerful, it, it overrules and overwhelms every other consideration. Yanis, I'm sure you have some thoughts um, after hearing Jason. Oh, I'm more than happy to take a back seat on this because Jason has said everything that I wanted to say. Uh, <laughs> uh, let, let me just um, you know, pique our um, audience by um, quoting Donald Trump because occasionally Donald Trump, in his uh, haze of misanthropy and madness, he comes up with very insightful points. One was several years ago when he said that he was asked, what, what, Mr. Trump, why are you so reluctant to acknowledge climate change? And he answer, his answer was, because if I acknowledge it, then I have to become a communist. And, <laughs> you know, I think that that is you know, so accurate. So he says, look, I'm a capitalist, right? I'm not going to confess that um, communism is the only way of surviving. So bugger it. You know, I'm 80. I have another 10 years to live. I don't care what happens to the next generation. This is essentially what he's saying, because you know, he's an extremely um, cynical man. And th that was his point, in the same way that you know, he doesn't have any, any religious beliefs whatsoever, but he's quite happy to play along with the evangelical right. <laughs> um, he doesn't care about communism, about capitalism, about anything. He just says, look, my interests are there. And I'm not going to acknowledge climate catastrophe, not because I don't believe in it, but because it doesn't suit me. The only people who fail time and again to be consistent with what they claim to believe in are the green parties in power, like the German Greens in Germany, for instance, who are, as we speak, presiding over a major catastrophe, um, both in terms of their policies for the environment, energy, as well as you know, their uh, pursuit of never-ending war in Ukraine, in Gaza, in Yemen, everywhere. Uh, so the people who actually claim to understand the uh, threats to our you know, humanity, to our life, to our planet, are the ones who are not prepared to stand up for what they claim to believe in, unlike Donald Trump. It seems on this topic, the level of motivated reasoning is quite incredible. Um, at the point in human history where we're on the precipice of self-destruction as a civilization, I am always stunned to see informed, intelligent people sticking to their guns about our economic model and coming up with with apparent solutions, which we know won't work, which have been shown not to work over 50 years, but they will opt for a false solution rather than address the, the problem head on because of the, the implications are simply too great. Um, I, I wanted to come back, Jason, to the frame of growth, which, which you've used to great effect, and you hinted at it in your first answer, but could you just unpack why what it is about capitalism that gives it this growth imperative? Why it's so difficult just via regulation or making tweaks here and there to make capitalism compatible with an ecological future? Yeah, so I mean, the, the, the growth imperatives of capitalism are, are a, a major obstacle for us to achieve uh, our ecological goals. Uh, so we know that um, in high income nations, continued economic growth is 
uh, is basically directly inimical to us achieving sufficiently rapid decarbonization to meet the Paris Agreement objectives. Right? This has been demonstrated very thoroughly in the scientific literature. Um, it also makes it extremely difficult for us to uh, to achieve um, you know real reductions in material use, which um, which is a major driver of of biodiversity loss and so on. So, I mean, this is not to say that that GDP can't be absolutely decoupled from CO2. I mean, we, let's be very clear, it can be. I mean, there's no necessary relationship between the two. And we've seen um, we've seen quite a lot of absolute decoupling over the past couple of decades. It's not it's not new at all. Um, there's this uh, this fascination that our media has with um, with periodically trotting out graphs showing GDP, you know, rising while absolute while uh, consumption-based CO2 emissions decline in certain high-income countries, uh, as if this is something, uh, you know, uh, that demonstrates that capitalism is somehow compatible with achieving ecological goals. Uh, but it's not. I mean, this is not surprising. It's totally expected. Um, the, when it comes to to decarbonization, the, the the overriding question we have to pay attention to is speed. And we know that in high-income countries, uh, you know, very dramatic, rapid reductions in emissions are required for them to stay within their fair shares of Paris-compliant carbon budgets, um, much faster than than any of the even even the highest-performing countries are are presently achieving. So, at existing rates, we have a study published in the Lancet recently, the Lancet Planetary Health. At, at existing rates, we we found that the the eleven countries that have achieved absolute decoupling over the past uh, ten years um, are are basically on track to uh, to reach zero emissions uh, in about 200 years, right? Which is just, I mean, a, an absolute disgrace uh, of a violation of our of our collectively agreed targets on on climate, right? Um, I mean, this means burning their fair share of the Paris climate, uh, carbon budgets. Um, I mean, more than 20 times over. It's obscene, actually. So. So we need to we need to focus on what's actually required here, which is very rapid decarbonization. And basically, um, the growth imperatives of capitalism work against that, uh, because growth requires more energy use than would otherwise be the case under any given technological regime. And the larger uh, energy demand makes it more difficult for us to decarbonize uh, very rapidly. Right. So um, this is the issue now. Like, what does growth have to do with capitalism? Uh, I think some people think of, of kind of growth as the problem itself, which I disagree with, actually. I mean, the problem, I think, is the underlying structure of the economy, capitalism. I mean, capitalism requires growth. Why? Well, primarily uh, because a growing economy uh, continually aggregate uh, increases in, in production makes it easier to stabilize accumulation, right? So it's, it's, it's in order to, to create the conditions for perpetual accumulation that capital requires growth. But there are also other really interesting features of our economy, of a capitalist economy, that become effectively dependent on growth, right? So, I mean, just look around you. Every, every time there's even the mildest of recessions, like a small dip in aggregate output in a given year can have catastrophic social consequences, right? I mean, think about this. Even in the richest countries in the world, which have hu- like huge quantities of aggregate output, uh, even a small dip in, uh, in the growth rate can be, ca- be catastrophic. People lose their jobs, they lose their houses. They end up on the streets. They can't afford food. I mean, think about this. Deeply, a deeply unstable economy uh, that is vulnerable to these, uh, to, to mild fluctuations in aggregate output. Um, and the reason is because, uh, because access to basic resources is dependent on whether capital is willing to employ you. I mean, right? So if capital chooses for whatever reasons not to, not, to, uh, to not employ you because it's not profitable to do so, then you're out of luck and you're, you're immiserated. Uh, now, what's interesting is that is that socialist economies never had this problem, and this is this is actually quite fascinating to consider. Um, they were able, and, and and whatever you might say about 20th century social, uh, socialist economies, and there's plenty to critique. But one uh, dimension is fascinating, I think, worth uh, learning from, which is that regardless of the level of aggregate output, they were able to ensure access to uh, to um, the goods and services that are necessary for survival. Right, housing, healthcare, education. Uh, transit, et cetera, et cetera. So even if you have a dip in some forms of output, let's say we, a reduction in SUV production or whatever, uh, this is not going to lead to catastrophe because labor can easily be moved around to something that's actually more socially important. Okay? And so I think this is the, like, this is the, the nature of the beast we face, uh, such that uh, we, we need perpetual growth in the economy in order to, to try to mop up uh, unemployment, which is a perpetual crisis under capitalism. We constantly have a, an unemployment rate of two or three percent. In fact, economists want to have this unemployment rate. It keeps wages low. Um, 
And so the only solution to the perpetual crisis of unemployment is more growth. Like, let's get private industry to, to grow its production and mop up this unemployed labor. Um, but there's, there's other approaches that one could take, right? Like a public job guarantee, which is precisely what ecological economists have always argued for, uh, right? I mean, ensure that anyone who wants to has the option of training to participate in socially useful, socially necessary forms of production, renewable energy, uh, um, you know, build outs, uh, insulating homes, building affordable homes, uh, expanding public transit networks and public housing, uh, whatever it might be, right? There's plenty of production that needs to happen. And it's only under capitalism that we have this insane situation where, uh, where productive capacities like, like labor are left completely unemployed and in misery, even though we have problems that could be solved with their assistance. Um, this is an artificial scarcity of capitalism that maintains the need for perpetual growth and private production, but can easily be overcome. Uh, so I think that's, I mean, this is, uh, I mean, perhaps what uh, even Donald Trump himself may have realized in the, in the remark that Yanis is pointing to, um, that, uh, it, you know, it, 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 I mean, I, I doubt he was this intelligent on this particular point, but, <laughs> but if he wants to achieve ecological stability, this is going to require some kind of post-growth arrangements in rich countries. And in order to stabilize an economy that's, uh, that doesn't have perpetually increasing aggregate output, then, uh, then, you, then you need to decommodify uh, labor and uh, essential public services. Well, let, let me add my wrinkle to this, uh, looking at exactly the same story from a slightly different perspective, one which is very uh, topical and you know, uh, preoccupies lots of people today. Take artificial intelligence, for instance, or automation, you know, digitization, uh, robots. Yeah, consider a company that employs a hundred people. And let's say that uh, this company produces a thousand units of something, yeah? gizmos. So it's, um, you know, 10 gizmos per worker per month. Okay. Now suppose that um, a new piece of artificial intelligence or a robot is introduced, it's made available. The business can uh, employ it and it can produce those 1,000 gizmos using 50 workers. If this company is owned by one person or by shareholders, anonymous shareholders who are represented by a CEO, what will happen is the CEO is going to fire half of the workers and employ the piece of artificial intelligence. And when you say to free marketeers, isn't this a problem? Because think about it. An alternative to firing half of the workers would be to reduce working hours by 50%. So instead of working eight hours a day, they could work four hours a day and the rest of the time they could spend looking after their kids, uh, re-educating themselves, writing poetry, bumming around and, you know, um, repleting, uh, repleting their, their spent reserves. Um, the answer is, oh, but, you know, if they get fired, it doesn't matter because the market knows how to create new jobs for them. But the only way that the market can create new jobs for them is either for a new need to be implanted into people's minds through advertising, through marketing, or some realm has to be uh, some rail of actual experiential value must be commodified so that people, in order to gain access to that which they had as part of the commons, now have to pay for it, and therefore some other business employs the 50 workers who were fired. But that means more cement, yeah, more um, production of materials in order to create the company that will be producing stuff that will be satiating a need that was already satiated through a commons, which now doesn't exist because it has been destroyed, in order to create the demand to absorb the other 50 workers. So even if unemployment doesn't increase, which usually does, it's called structural unemployment, even the you know, right-wing economists have a word for it. Even if they, those 50 workers were fired because of the AI, instead of being allowed simply to work 50% of the time, um, 
even if they are not becoming unemployed, they will be producing things that society doesn't really need. Um, and, and doing so in a way that depletes resources with ecological damage, with um, social damage. Everybody keeps working eight hours, 10 hours, 12 hours a day. Everybody resembling a guinea pig, running faster and faster on the same treadmill, not going anywhere. That's John Kenneth Galbraith's uh, um, depiction of the affluent society where everybody's doing more and more and more, producing more and more and more, achieving less and less satisfaction. So this, the whole criticism of capitalism, from our perspective, is that not that it is unjust, but efficient, but it is inefficient, and therefore it is unjust. I, I, think, it's, I think it's instructive that when you look at history, you realize that elites and those in power agree with what you just said, Yanis. Because during wartime, oh, yes. when we really need to be efficient, what do we rely on? The market? Or, or do we go towards state planning, to rationing, and actually deciding very consciously, not using capital um, and profit returns as our criteria, but what we actually need, and that's where we divert our resources. Um, so I think it's quite instructive because we're in another crisis. We're not fighting fascism in the same way, although fascism is obviously rearing its head again. But we're not in the same situation quite as World War I or World War II. Yet we are in a moment where we urgently and rapidly need to change course. We need to mobilize our resources for a very different goal. And the profit motive has failed repeatedly to rise to this challenge. Um, can, can, I, can I just add, uh, you know, the, yeah. since I mentioned John Kenneth Galbraith before, okay. uh, you just reminded me that the job that he was given by uh, FDR during the war was to be the price czar, uh, to mm. pr preside over the war economy of the United States and to fix every price. And because I, I, I was... Um, very fortunate to have met the old man in the 1990s. I asked him, I said, you know, as a fledgling economist back then, I said to him, Professor Galbraith, how did you do it? How could you fix all the prices of every commodity in the United States of America? I mean, it must be a gigantic job. He said, no, it wasn't that hard. So what do you mean? You were already fixed by the cartels. <laughs> there we go. Um, Jason, I wanted to come back to something that you that you said. I'm just uh, I kind of want to dig a little deeper on the question of decoupling, which is sort of central to this whole debate of green growth and whether we can stick with capitalism, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. You, you're absolutely right, of course, in what you say that the arguments fail on their own terms because even in the best case scenario, we're looking at centuries, and we don't have centuries to decouple um, to the degree that's needed. But given, you know, the power of exponential growth, is it feasible ever really to have that sort of, can you decouple the creation of value in, measured in dollars and, and yen from resources? Because there are various relevant metrics, aren't there, for ecological decline. You talked about emissions uh, as being a key one, but there, there are many others. Um, but anyway, I'd like just to hear your thoughts on that. Yeah, it's interesting. I mean, like the way I normally think about approaching this is, is simply those, um, you know, you see those, those graphs uh, that show the relationship between objective well-being uh, measures, like, let's say, life expectancy, education, things like that, um, you know, various health indicators, et cetera, and, and then GDP per capita on the, on the other side. And so then you, you can see quite clearly that the, the countries with higher levels of GDP per capita have higher levels of objective well-being. Uh, et cetera, et cetera. And this becomes a very, and of course the opposite, but for the poor countries it's much lower. And so this becomes an easy argument for, well, clearly we need uh, perpetual economic growth in order to increase uh, and maximize human well-being. So even, even if you just care about well-being and not about profit accumulation, this is still the, 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 way, the way it should be uh, approached. But what's interesting is that, I mean, for a long time, ecological economists have criticized this representation because, um, uh, because, because GDP, right, is, is a problem in, in one crucial respect. 
it's it's an aggregate indicator of production, right? So it basically aggregates everything that the economy produces into a single metric, which is based on prices. So therefore, like according to this metric, a uh, million euros worth of uh, worth of healthcare is worth exactly the same as a million euros worth of tear gas. Okay, but we know for a fact that uh, that producing healthcare is going to have a much stronger impact on social well-being outcomes than producing uh, the tear gas. Okay. So, and this is very, this is very clearly demonstrated when it comes to, to objective well-being metrics, what matters is not aggregate production, but what we are producing, mm. right? The specific goods and services that are being produced and whether people have access to them. So in an economy that uh, produces a lot, like say the USA, but, uh, but has very poor access to basic, to basic goods and services, right? People, again, can't access healthcare, education, like higher education is extremely expensive. Um, housing is totally substandard and unaffordable, et cetera, et cetera. Then you're going to have high levels of output uh, together with relatively low, uh, quite depressing levels of well-being. Um, by contrast, with a much lower level of aggregate output, you could have much higher levels of, of well-being if you're investing in things like universal public services and if you're distributing income and resources more evenly, right? This is what matters when it comes to well-being. So this is not to say that some level of growth is not important for achieving uh, you know, for, for building out the infrastructure and producing the goods and services that people need to live good lives. Um, but with a more rational, more just allocation of, of production uh, towards the things that we know to be most effective at, at generating social outcomes, uh, we can achieve, you know, much higher levels with, with much less aggregate output. And that, that I think is, I mean, this is the way that any rational democratic economy would actually be run. Um, you know, there's discourse about degrowth out there these days. There's a big misunderstanding about this. Like a lot of people think, oh, you're, this, this is a system that's just going to reduce all forms of production. And that's obviously going to be agony and misery. <laughs> but uh, I mean, even a cursory reading of this literature indicates that this is not at all what they want. What they're calling for is, a de is democratic decision making over what forms of production should be increased and what forms of production should be decreased in order to maximize social and ecological uh, uh, objectives. Okay, so in the middle of an ecological emergency, should we be producing SUVs and private jets and industrial beef and McMansions? The answer is clearly no. The production of these things should decline. <laughs> uh, and at the same time, we should, we should invest our productive capacities in producing other kinds of things. Uh, or in, in some cases, the things were already produced. Uh, they just need to be decommodified. So for example, how, like housing. In, in many countries, there's plenty of housing stock. It's simply that uh, because of financial speculation and uh, out of control, uh, you know, renty or hoarding, it's basic, it's, un it's unaffordable to people, and, but that can be easily dealt with with policy. And so the question here is, uh, um, what can we do to, uh, to do things that we know are going to improve our chances of achieving ecological and social goals and do those things, focus on achieving those things uh, while scaling down less necessary forms of production that are, that are destructive, you know, ecologically egregious, socially unnecessary uh, and usually exist only to maximize uh, profit accumulation and elite consumption, right? All of us can identify what those sectors are and any rational person can immediately decide that these are unnecessary. In fact, what's interesting is that, is that, um, is that we know from empirical studies uh, of democratic decision-making over production that people make these choices, right? Like look at the citizens' assemblies that have happened in the UK and France and Spain. When people have democratic control over over how the economy should be organized. They can very quickly agree on precisely this kind of vision. Uh, it's not rocket science at all. It just requires uh, like ultimately achieving democratic control over productive capacity and finance. Uh, and, and that really needs to be our objective. And I, and like, um, I mean, speaking of the European green parties, I'm, I find them intolerable <laughs> for, I mean, for lots of reasons, but this is the, I mean, uh, in terms of their analysis, this is the fundamental problem, is that they fail, they fail to, to realize what needs to be achieved here. Uh, and, uh, and therefore, they, they simply do not offer hope for the future. They're a complete dead end. Uh, and something different must, must replace them, uh, something like a democratic eco-socialist formation. So, I mean, there's a lot there, so many threads. Um... But yeah, I, mean, I think we're all in agreement that GDP is a terrible measure for collective well-being. It's not a proxy for, um, for the values that we care about most. 
when we hit those resource limits, that has huge political implications. One, it puts the questions of inequality center stage. But two, I think some of the state planners uh, after World War II saw growth as a way of trying to avoid global conflict between the major powers. And I think there's some logic and reason to that. So when once we realize, okay, we're hitting these ecological limits, this simply doesn't work anymore. It means two things. We have to confront the question of inequality, but it also means we have to confront the, I think, the increased likelihood of conflict between the major powers. Is that something that degrowthers are focusing on? This kind of the geopolitical element of it. Allow me three points. Uh, the first is that to understand how bad GDP is as a measure of well-being. We have to go back to a time when the most powerful members of the British Empire understood it. When Captain Cook arrived in Botany Bay, one of the things that he put in his diary was his dismay, dismay at the quality, life of, quality of life of the Aborigines. He was saying, you know, these people are having a great time. You know, they, they, they hunt and fish for two hours they catch enough food to eat very well, and then the rest of the time they spend it with, uh, you know, telling stories to one another and uh, performing rituals. And he was dismayed by that because it was a very bad example for his men, for his sailors. That's your point about inequality. And it's about the structure of power. You know, the fact, what was the GDP of the Aborigines? Zero. Zero. What is the GDP of the Aboriginal community today in Australia? Quite a few million. Today, the Aboriginal community, in, 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 in uh, what is left of it in Australia after the genocide of the Aborigines, you know, their conditions are far worse than anything that humanity has ever experienced in terms of diabetes, in terms of, of uh, you know, uh, life expectancy, of alcoholism, of all that. So what, the fact that they make millions now collectively as a community, whereas back then they, they had zero GDP, what does it, what does it say? It says that the capitalist organization of society and the economy is detrimental to the uh, well-being of people. That's what it says. And detrimental in a way that you know, their happiness had to be destroyed because it was a very bad example for the proletarians in Britain and the sailors of the Royal Navy. That's point number one. Point number two, we can't go back to the pre-capitalist Aboriginal mode of production for a variety of reasons. So we are now in a social structure which is predicated upon the reinforcement and accumulation of capital. Call it capitalism or as I call it techno-feudalism these days, doesn't matter. It's the reign of capital and capital accumulation. Now, in this world, there is no measurement of economic activity other than GDP that makes sense. So to those who say, oh, well, let's stop using GDP and let's use something else. I say, listen, it's like saying that, you know, if I'm dying of pneumonia and I have a very high fever, we should stop measuring my temperature uh, using Celsius. The, the metric doesn't matter. What matters is you have a system whose capacity to maintain itself in some kind of semblance of equilibrium, dynamic equilibrium, uh, or balanced disequilibrium, let's say, depends on more and more GDP growth. So what do we do? Attack the symptom, which is the failure of GDP to correlate with human prosperity, or do we attack the cause, which is the fact that we are all slaves of capital accumulation, whether we're proletarians selling our labor to the owners of capital or indeed capitalists who, you know, if you're a capitalist today, uh, you are terrified of bankruptcy because you know what will happen to you if you become a proletarian or a member of the precariat. So your, it is your duty to yourself to squeeze the living daylights out of your workforce and out of nature and to destroy nature as much as you can so as not to become a proletarian or a member of the precariat. This is why, this is why I'm a lefty, to cut a long story short. <laughs> and finally, of course, on the question of degrowth. 
I think that the left, including me, I had to be, you know, people like Jason have helped me to um, recalibrate my thinking, to uh, deprogram myself and reprogram myself. Uh, because, you know, Jason was, was right to say that socialism did not suffer from the same growth mania as capitalism, but nevertheless, under the Soviet planning system, uh, there was a, simply because they were not very good at planning, they relied on quantification, on, on quantifying everything and, you know, just giving instructions on the basis of quantities. You, it was all quantitative measures. You know, you have to produce so many tractors. And if you produce more than that, then you get a brownie point, and the little star of the, you know, of, of the revolution. Um, so that, that was a very silly system too. It was a, today with, with algorithms and uh, artificial intelligence. I mean, think about Alexa and you know the algorithm inside Amazon. If the Soviet Union had that, that kind of way of um, you know matching suppliers with uh, suppliers and and producers with consumers, mm -hmm. um, you could design democratically a really brilliant system whereby prosperity would be maximized and the production of cement, the production of CO2, the production of all those things that we need to degrow would plummet while prosperity goes all the way up. Unfortunately, it's Jeff Bezos who has that technology and not socialist communes. And this is to me very interesting. I think that um, that Yanis has actually done himself a disservice here because uh, he could have plugged his book, Another Now, which is a, a, I think a really interesting depiction of um, of what democratic workplaces could look like. Actually, it's very compelling. Um, my position is that I, I mean I actually agree with this, uh, and I'm willing to change my view in the future if better evidence unfolds. But my current position is that um, we should think of the economy in terms of two sectors, like two broad sectors, basically, and. And one should be a kind of like the, the kind of socially necessary sector, which should be decommodified, right? I think there should be universal public services for everything that is necessary for survival. And so we should we should prioritize public production of the things we know to be most important: healthcare, education, affordable housing, nutritious food, clean energy, water, you know, childcare, elder care, recreational facilities, parks. These this is the core of it. The core economy should be decommodified. Access should not be mediated by prices and income. But the rest of the economy, where we're producing coffee makers and watches and beer or whatever, I mean, there's no reason that this cannot be mediated by markets, but they should be post-capitalist markets, right? Okay. Uh, where, and, and that simply means the, 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 the firms that are doing the production should be democratized and decisions about what to produce should be democratic, mm -hmm. uh, whether that's by the community or, or, by, or by the workers. I mean, there's different, there's different modes of democratic production, but that's, this is the key principle. The third tier of the economy, I would add to this, is finance. And this is, and this is the big one, I think, right? Um, finance uh, represents command over our collective productive capacity. It is insane that this considerable power, this world-changing power, is in the hands of a, few, of a relatively few elites mm. whose only objective is to maximize profit. If, if, this was, uh, if, if this was democratically managed, right, through public financial institutions, let's say, instead of in the hands of commercial banks, uh, where we can make investments based on what we agree uh, are crucially important things to produce, uh, then uh, this would be world changing. And I think this is the other element of, uh, of, of democratic eco-socialism that needs to be uh, conceptualized and theorized further. But Jason, uh, one small point here, but I think an important one. If you do have, to, if you do democratize corporations on the basis of one person, one vote, essentially you end the share markets. If in addition to that, you provide a digital wallet from the central bank to every resident in the country, in the block, in the continent, in the world, then suddenly the bank, the financial sector goes away. Because today there are two pylons holding up finance and its power essentially to hijack the world. One is the share market, because most of the money that's being lent by, by, by banks, by bankers, goes into speculation in the share market. So if you do away with the share market because you have democratized corporations, then effectively you've chopped off one of the legs of the giant financial sector. 
And then if you take away their monopoly of payments today, in order to you, you use a plastic card or an app on your phone to, you know, to, to buy a coffee, you need to open a bank account with a private bank. But if you have a digital wallet provided by the government, by the central bank, then that goes. So you take away their monopoly over payments, you take away the share markets, that's it, gone. You don't even need to ban them. They've gone. They've evolved out of existence. That's why financiers will do their utmost to make sure that you do not democratize corporations. Yeah, that's or interesting. The Although, um, yeah, that's interesting, and I'm and I'm I'm compelled by that. Uh, although, I guess, uh, like concretely, I have I have this in my mind, right? I have like the reality of uh, of money creation. Okay, like like finance, like a huge amount of finance is effectively creating money and uh, and and investing it to mobilize production somewhere, right? Uh, the, the the power of money creation is in the hands of states, but states have effectively rescinded their rights to use this, uh, and and franchised it to commercial banks. And so we have a system where where commercial banks are making decisions about what what kinds of things to finance. And this is precisely why, uh, as you pointed out earlier, Raul. We have this, you know, incredible investments in things like uh, fossil fuels, but uh, an incredible paucity of investments in things like renewable energy, okay? Because they're not as profitable. They earn profits about a third as much as fossil fuels do. Um, and so I like I think this is egregious, and and uh, and there's no reason that that uh, that we can't have a public finance mechanism uh, sure. that would make those allocations instead, right? But you know, uh, but Jason, I think I think your mind should be put to rest because. The moment, the moment you have a digital wallet provided by the central bank to everyone, you know, it is the, the, the central bank that actually takes over the role of money creation for everyone. Mm. Uh, what is it that allows Barclays Bank or Deutsche Bank or Sociedad General to create money today? The fact that you know they can just, out of thin air, out create thin a loan air. for you know, billions, yeah? mm. and know that because they own the payment system. If they go bankrupt, then society is going to consider them too big to fail and therefore will back them. But if we went to that system where you have a digital world for everyone, the payment system is completely safe, secure and public. And let's say when we allow somebody to create money as part of a private financial institution on the condition of, you know what, mate, if you fail, you're on your own. Then suddenly they will not be able to create money, <laughs> even if they can or they will not want to. And if they do, they would, at some point they will fail and they will disappear through a Darwinian process. Can I come back, Jason, just to this point about growth as an arms race? Because what it confers on states, if, if 10 kind of benign nations decide to say, okay, we're gonna end growth, we're just gonna focus on meeting the primary needs of our citizens and another nation says, no, we're just going to carry on growing, growing, growing and to acquire sort of wealth as, as a form of power to dominate globally. Is that a difficult dynamic to address? Do we need a kind of a, a cascading series of effects culturally and politically to enable the sort of vision that, that we're talking about to, to come to be? Yeah, there's a lot to say about this. I do think it's, uh, it's a bit under theorized, but let me start with some, some first principles. Um, and that is that uh, um, it seems very clear to me that that capitalism and its growth imperatives are the major driver of conflicts and war in our world today. Right. Uh, I mean, um, if you just if you just look at uh, I mean, uh, you can start with the, all the all the colonial wars over the past 500 years. But even in the post-colonial period, the, the, the incredible assaults on global South states to topple socialist or otherwise progressive leaders. Um, and then today, the constant wars that are being perpetrated by the U.S. and its stooges um, in the Middle East and elsewhere. I mean, even just look at the assault on Gaza today, uh, right? I mean, this should be theorized uh, with respect to, to, to capitalism, okay? Because uh, the, the U.S. has always been very clear that it cannot tolerate, um, you know, uh, national developments in the states of the Middle East, Okay, this became uh, abundantly clear to them in the 1960s. If you're going to have sovereign uh, states run by progressive or, or, or even worse for them, socialist governments, which were uh, everywhere, which were rising everywhere in the 1960s and 70s, um, this is effectively like when global South states, particularly in the Middle East, at the nexus of Africa and Asia, 
um, start to be able to produce and consume their own resources, right, for their own national needs, for, for local human development, et cetera, et cetera. Mm-hmm. This uh, constrains uh, access to resources by the core powers. This is intolerable. It has always been intolerable. Uh, um, real national sovereignty and national development in the global south must be prevented in order to maintain access to cheap labor and raw materials and control over, uh, over markets and so on. Um, uh, Israel has always been effectively uh, crucial to US capitalist interests because it is a, effectively a, a launching platform for fomenting instability in the Middle East and toppling uh, progressive movements, et cetera, et cetera. Uh, so, th- I mean, this is why despite, I mean, you know, massive global op- op- opinion turning against the US backing of Israel, they continue with it, yeah. right? Uh, it- it's because this, this, this kind of thing is essential to, to the very possibility of continued capital accumulation in the US. V- like, like violence in the periphery is, uh, is necessary for the continuation of capital accumulation in the core, okay? Uh, and, so, and so in a post-capitalist, post-growth economy, uh, where you can meet human needs at a high standard and, you know, ending social crisis um, without needing uh, perpetually increasing appropriation of energy and resources, then the, the pressure for this kind of violence dissipates really rapidly, right? Like you don't need imperialism to stabilize a post-capitalist economy. Uh, you need imperialism to stabilize uh, a capitalist growth-addicted economy. Uh, so th- this is the first thing, right? <laughs> um, now, I think you do raise important questions. Um, if, if a few states were to go it alone uh, and therefore uh, right, make themselves vulnerable to an arms race that they would then lose, let's say, by, a st- by another state that decided to be very growthist, then you might have a problem. But I think that these problems can be relatively easily addressed. I mean, first of all, why not pursue this in multilateral terms, right? I mean, uh, uh, it's utopian, sure, but you should do it <laughs> anyways, like the, like the fossil fuel non-proliferation treaty, uh, which thousands of scientists and Nobel laureates have backed, uh, is exactly this principle, right? Get the core, the core economies to agree to scale down production of fossil fuels, okay? That's effectively like a degrowth treaty in a way, <laughs> right? Um, uh, but otherwise, I mean, is this really a threat? Uh, like if you have a defense pact and one nation has a nuclear weapon, has nuclear weapons, then I mean, are you really under threat? So it doesn't seem to me, it seems like, like threats, uh, this kind of threats arises precisely because of competition between core powers over access to resources and cheap labor. Uh, that seems to be the major driver. And so if, if we're able to address that, then I think we've made really significant progress. I think that's what I would say. But, but I say this also like not as an expert in, in the geopolitics of post-growth, I think that that's something that does need to be explored further. You're of course right that you know all the horrendous costs of capitalism are basically imposed on on the global south and what you call the the, the periphery and the poor. I, I do think that it does it does intensify class conflict within nations, right? Because as you pointed out before, I mean, uh, like the uh, the elite's ability to rely on on growth basically allows them. It, it's it's a salve on an otherwise exploitative system. Okay, so. They're effectively saying this, okay, we're, we're, we're not going to, like the original demands of the labor movements <laughs> were, were ambitious. Uh, they were, let us have, you know, decommodified universal public services. Let us have a public job guarantee, right? Uh, effectively decommodifying labor in this crucial respect. Let us have democracy in the workplace, okay? Let us have dignity and living wages, et cetera, et cetera. Um, capital was unable to concede to these demands and maintain uh, patterns of accumulation. Cool. In order to in order to uh, to make some concessions, uh, th- they had to they had to effectively um, rely even more heavily on uh, e- exploitation in the periphery. Right, like labor in nature has to be cheapened somewhere. Mm-hmm. The core economies were able to externalize that cheapening to to the periphery, and this allows them to make some concessions to the working class. Um, but their and their concession was effectively okay. You, you don't get these things you were demanding, but we 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 will ensure that you have a steady flow of. Of, uh, of whatever, iPhones and flat screen TVs, uh, which is, I have to say, uh, like, and by the way, I believe that everyone should have iPhones, well, should have a, 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 fun, a good functioning, high quality smartphone. Um, 
Well, but apart uh, from me, but, mate. Apart from me. This is right. <laughs> apart from you. But um, but this is a shallow. This is a shallow, pathetic uh, uh, replacement for the original demands of the of the of the working classes in the core. And I think that we need to recover those. And so coming back to a position of of class conflict, I think is good actually for us to be doing. Um, if we're in a situation where uh, where um, you know uh, where, where production needs to be where aggregate output needs to be limited, then we're in a position where we have to fight about what are we going to be producing and for whose benefit, right? Uh, and that's precisely the arguments that we should be having. <laughs> uh, like, like the restoration of a class politics, I think is actually essential. And, and I think we need to have, you know, effective democratic socialist movements ready uh, to, to take on that struggle. Hmm. Because that struggle is going to come. Guaranteed it's going to come. Mm-hmm. Uh, I mean, you can see it happening already, like, uh, I mean, here's a very mild example, I suppose, but look at, uh, at Spain. Um, I mean, because of devastating drought in Spain over the past uh, year or two, the price of olive oil has doubled, okay? Like uh, huge amounts of olive oil production have been basically taken off the grid as a result of the, of the drought. And so then you have a situation where, okay, only some people, the rich can afford to buy olive oil, which is a staple in Spain now, yeah. and the poor just have to cut their consumption of it entirely. Uh, and so you have a, a deeply unjust allocation of finite resources. Uh, olive oil is a small example. Wait until it's more serious, you know, later on in the century, if we fail, if we fail to adequately address uh, climate breakdown. Um, I mean, if you don't have movements in place that are, that are ready to you know, have a real struggle over the fair allocation of resources, then you're in trouble. And I think we have to be building those movements now. I need to speak out for the working class of um, the metropolis. Uh, for the blue collar workers uh, who might be listening and thinking, well, I, not many will be, because they are so disenfranchised that they are not likely to be listening to us, folks. But nevertheless, the, the point I want to make is that um, this is not just exploitation of the periphery. Mm-hmm. If you look at the working class in the United States, there is no group of people who are more hard done by than the US working class. This is why that's what explains the Donald Trump phenomenon, or the north of England, for that matter, or parts of Germany, as we speak. The depravity to which these people have been reduced by the system is mind-boggling. In the same way that, you know, remember the point I made before, that the aborigines were much better off when their GDP was zero. Um, the fact that you know, GDP amongst uh, you know, the Midwest working class in the United States is not lower than it is in Kerala, India. Nevertheless, their living standards, their life quality, the quality of their lives, far worse than in Kerala in India, far worse. You know, being poor in the United States is a far worse experience than being poor in India or in Bangladesh or in Laos. There's nothing worse than being poor in a country like that or the north of England for that matter. So you have, you know, parts of the third world, what we used to call the third world, being um, transported to the middle of the metropolis and parts of the metropolis being transported to Calcutta and to Mumbai and to Jakarta. Uh, this is part and parcel of imperialism, part and parcel of the um, manifest crisis of capital accumulation, which always um, creates inequality, unevenness, and transports depravity and redistributes it across its realm. I just want to affirm what Yanis has said. I mean, I, I strongly, I strongly, strongly agree. Um, I lived in London for 12, for 12 years, and I have to say that, that living in the UK uh, played a major role in, in my political radicalization <laughs> because, because uh, it's dystopic, actually. And uh, I mean, it, it's this incredibly wealthy economy that commands the heights of finance and productive capacities. Mm. And yet its people live in absolute misery. And this is despite 500 mm. years, well, hundreds of years of, of, of plunder, of colonial and imperial plunder. And they cannot uh, deliver even basic dignity to their working classes. Uh, it's, uh, it's, it's depraved, actually. I mean, the, the, the British ruling class is, to me, one of the most utterly depraved factions of, of human society. 
that I've ever encountered, uh, and they do it mockingly, uh, right? Um, and and if you live in the UK, particularly in London, I mean, you see these contradictions so brazenly. Uh, I mean, amidst just the most extraordinary wealth, you see uh, you see slums and uh, and mass deprivation. It's uh, it's it's devastating. And this is, I mean, this is this is cap this is capital, right? This is the height of capital. This is capital in the 21st century. Uh, again, I mean, we live in the, an absolute shadow of the world that we could live in, mm -hmm. because uh, because we don't we don't have democratic control over over our productive capacities. Uh, nothing makes that clearer than uh, than spending time in a country like the UK. And Ken Loach's latest movie, as long as every other movie that Ken Loach has ever directed. Right. Yeah. It, it's just a horrible truth that desperate people are profitable in this system. You know, they want to keep people desperate precisely to keep their profits up. Um, well, they are not even, they're not even, they don't even need to do that. Hmm. Look, I, I think that, you know, the, the people that Jason correctly, the rich in the United, the United Kingdom and the United States, that Jason correctly said they're depraved and they are just cynical and ruthless. They are all that, but they don't even realize it. And there's no, they, they, I don't think they try to keep people desperate. It is, it, it, it is a byproduct of what they do that people become desperate. And the people's desperation becomes functional to their rent accumulation and profiteering. But for them, there's no connection between the depravity and they, they look at the, at, the, at, the, at the poverty around them in the shadow of the shard and of you know, the, the, the financial sector in the city of London. And they see this as an accident, as a preventable accident. They don't consider their deeds to be responsible for the poverty around them, even though the poverty around them is functional to their profits. So it's worse than that. They don't even have a sense of um, guilt about what they're doing because they do not understand. You see, the human mind is amazing at uh, convincing itself that it deserves its privileges. I think some people are aware, Yanis. I think it is quite cynical. And there's been strategies over centuries to ensure that people are, are desperate. Not everyone is conscious of I that. I don't think so, you know. At all, I don't believe really? that. You know, the very rich who actually know that and who feel very insecure would go on television like you know Warren Buffett in the United States or Bill Gates and demand more taxation of themselves and they say well what can we do you know we argued for it and the government is not doing it and then they go away and they do whatever it is that they do which increases poverty again but they have spoken in favor of taxing themselves and they believe it they're not being even you know hypocritical but the whole system of power in a Darwinian manner, deselects anyone who, in a position of power, would actually tax the oligarchs who are asking for themselves to be taxed. I suppose my understanding of the enclosures, the whole logic of enclosure, is to deprive people of what they, they need to make them desperate so they are exploited. No, 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 no. You're very wrong on this. I, I will insist. No, it was really very simple. The roof leaked of their manor house. They didn't have money. They could see that dirty little merchants in Southampton, people who would never be allowed to have dinner with them in their clubhouse, they made huge quantities of money selling wool. They could not repair the bloody roof. So they decided they were there going to produce wool. So they got rid of the peasants to, and replaced them with sheep. For them, it was essential to keep the roof over their head. They never had the concept that they were creating need amongst the many outside the enclosures in order to create the, the, the British working class. This is what they were doing, but they had no concept of that. It was not their intention. Their intention was, you know, to get some of the, of the dough that, that, that was in the hands of the filthy merchants in Bristol and, and in Liverpool in order to, to, to repair the roofs and to continue to live the, li the life that they were told by their uh, awful parents that uh, they deserved so I, th I think it's i think it's both but i do think that uh, that raul is onto something here uh, because i wrote about this to some extent in the, in the first chapter of less is more um uh drawing on historical material um 
that was put forward uh, in the in the brilliant book, The Invention of Capitalism. Uh, and and look, I, I mean, it's interesting because I mean, it's it's clear that a lot of the functionaries of the capitalist system, um, I think, actually believe that they're doing good, <laughs> uh, right? I mean, they, they do. They or do they had no that. choice, Tina. Or they had no choice, or whatever it might be. The roof was also, leaking. But, indeed, <laughs> the roof was leaking. <laughs> But at the same time, we do have reams of evidence, uh, both from England as well as from across the colonial territories, that um, that uh, there was an intent, like like part of the enclosure movement was an, an intentional attempt to abolish the commons, which they considered to be um, uh, like a nursery of of, uh, of idleness. <laughs> okay, like as long as people have access to the commons, then uh, then they will not work for you for cheap. And the early, the early capitalists in England were very well aware of this. Uh, and so part of the enclosure project was, uh, was to deprive people of access to necessary resources. So they would be forced to submit to wage labor on terms favorable to, the, to, the early, to these early capitalists. The same thing is true actually across the, across the, um, the, the, the global south. You know? when, when European colonizers arrived, uh, they immediately faced what they called the labor question. And this is written about extensively in the, in the correspondence. Yeah, I mentioned Captain Cook, who was incensed. Exactly. Be having a good time without... And so, exactly. And they're, in, they're enraged by the fact that they, like, they want to set up plantations and they want to set up mines and factories. And the local people refuse to work in these, uh, in these uh, industries because they have their own subsistence economies, right? Um, and so a process has to be engaged where you destroy the subsistence economy and cut off access to the commons in order to forcibly induce people to, uh, to work on your plantation. And, the, and, and that, in fact, was a very conscious strategy on the parts of, of, uh, of European capitalists who were engaged in the colonial projects and is also very well documented. So I think we also see it in the likes of, like, um, what's his name, the, the chancellor of the Exchequer in, uh, under Cameron's government. Uh, under Osborne? government? Osborne. Osborne. Yeah. <laughs> I mean, like, like the, the, the likes of Osborne are explicit about this kind of thing, no? Um, like, we have to get the British people back to work. We have to cut. And, so, and this requires cutting the generous That's welfare Tony Blair. benefits. That's Tony way. Blair. That's not even George yeah. Osborne. George Osborne. Tony copied. Blair. <laughs> so, uh, I mean, Bill Clinton did the same thing, actually, right? And so there's, a, there's an awareness among some of these uh, uh, individuals that's, that cutting access to collective goods is necessary to maintain the kind of um, inducement to labor and, and competitive productivity that capitalism requires for expansion. Um, but I do think the majority of people who are functionaries of, 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 the, of this economy are not so uh, mm. enlightened as to their true objectives. Mm -hmm. Guys, um, this has been so fascinating, but I, I know, Yanis, you have to go and catch a ferry. Jason, it's been a real pleasure. Uh, I hope to catch up properly another time with you and just hear what you're working on and how everything's going. Uh, but for now, yeah, thanks for both of your contributions. It's been great. Thanks very much, thanks, Raul. And, Thank you, Raul. And Yanis, uh, the next time you're in Spain, come to Barcelona and we'll have a coffee. All right, guys, take care. If you enjoyed this podcast, please like and subscribe to our channel.